Now, this probabilistic view of the universe did not sit well with a lot of people. It's saying that there, you know, that there wasn't a particular guiding force that made things react or roll downhill one way or the other. That it was strictly probability. It's just that the the more the, the disordered result you saw because it was the most probable thing to see. And this was because um, so, and so Boltzmann Ludwig here was the first person to propose this back in the in the late 1800s. And there was still a you know very strong religious influence in society and. In most religions, you have some sort of guiding force, um, you know, some creator that kind of makes things go in a certain way. And people still really wanted to see that even in their science. And so the fact that just random probability had a lot to do with it did not sit well with a lot of people. So when he proposed this idea, um, Ludwig Boltzmann was not particularly well received. Unfortunately, he was probably paranoid schizophrenic or at least clinically depressed at the time. And his rejection from his colleagues, he did not take very well and sadly took his own life as a, as, um, as a result of that. Uh, this is um, written in a biography, Boltzmann's Adam by David Lindy, which is a pretty interesting read. And even more tragic, so this is a picture of his, um, his tomb. And the experiments that proved that he was probably right were done only a couple years after his um, after his death. So his family, as a way of thumbing their nose at the scientific community that they blamed for their father's uh, death, engraved his equation on the tombstone. And this just says that the entropy of something is equal to a constant times the base 10 log of how many ways to achieve a configuration. This constant K, by the way, is now called Boltzmann's constant. All right, so let's talk about this thing, entropy, or S, as we call it. So this is a thermodynamic variable of state um, that describes the disorder of a particular state. It seems awkward, but the using the word disorder instead of order actually ends up being a little better. Now, as I said, uh, some background. A, it's a state function, which means that, to refresh your memory, that the entropy change of a particular process, whatever it is, is merely equal to the entropy at the end of the process minus the entropy at the beginning of the process. And what happened in between is utterly irrelevant for the overall change. And uh, so the larger the value of S, the more disorder a particular state has. So is the change in entropy of a particular process the key to spontaneity? Is it always disorder? Well, this brings us into the second law here. And the second law states that the entropy of the universe is always increasing. So in equation speak, it looks like this. So the delta S of the universe is equal to the delta S of the system plus the delta S of surroundings, and that sum is going to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, for entropy, it is still useful, as we did for energy and enthalpy, to divide the universe up into two convenient chunks. The system, defined as the part that you care about, and the surroundings defined as the rest of it. So one really, really big thing to point out here is that unlike energy, the entropy of the universe is not conserved. It is always increasing. And in fact, in some ways, the um, the direction of the increase in entropy of the universe is used to define the forward direction of time. But that's a bit for another class. All right, so for this and the next couple slides, or next several slides, 
we're going to talk about how entropy is manifested on the molecular scale in the chemistry context. So the simplest place to start is the three phases. In between solid, liquid, and gases, um, so the solids are you know, kind of defined by having atoms placed um, in close proximity in a very, very precise order. So that's a lot of order, which means that the solid states are lower in entropy. The gases are a bunch of particles with in random motion, so that, that represents the least ordered or the highest entropy. And of course, the liquids are somewhere in the middle. All right. Um, so now let's talk about you know switching between one phase or another. So you know some phase changes are going to result in an increase in the entropy of that system, namely you know solid going to liquid, properly called fusion, or the solid going to gas, and also liquid going to gas. So anything the gas is by far the least ordered phase. So these represent very large changes in entropy, and this a bit smaller. But on the other hand, um, you could have phase changes where the entropy of your system is decreased. So going from gas to a liquid, properly called condensation, or gas to a solid, properly called deposition. And of course, liquid going to a solid or freezing. Again, these two are relatively large changes. The liquid to solid is still a change, but not quite as much. All right, so now let's talk about, um, you know, compare you know, the entropy of a couple different cases. So first let's start with oxygen gas. Um, same pressure, same amount, same volume, but one's at 400 Kelvin and the other one's at 300 Kelvin. And would the entropy of these two samples be different? And the answer is yes. And why is that? Well, molecular motion actually increases with temperature. And it's more than just the speed. The type of motion is also important, and that's actually what, what, what varies with temperature. So the first kind of motion that you're probably familiar with, that we've talked about before, is merely translational motion. So this is something that, on, you know, that the only type of motion that atomic species has like the helium and neon that we've talked about so far. And this is just motion in the X, Y, Z directions, up, down, backwards, forwards, um, left or right. But when you get up to molecules, there's actually a couple of other options. The first one is vibrational motion. And so bonds, we've been drawing them as bars, but they are not perfectly rigid. Um, they are actually a little bit springy. And the atoms that are bonded together can vibrate back and forth a little bit around some equilibrium bond length. And they can also spin around a center of mass. And as temperature goes up, the translational motion gets faster. Um, but these modes of motion become available and there are more of, and more of them become available. So as things get higher, Along with moving faster, they vibrate more and possibly in more different ways, and they also rotate more. And since all that motion, um, so there are now more ways to distribute the kinetic energy of that system, that counts as an increase in entropy. Again, not just because of the increase in energy, but in how many ways it can be distributed, whether it's just translational um, or vibrational or rotational. Let's go back to atoms again. So I said that atoms don't vibrate or rotate. So if you increase the temperature of those, you know, they're not going to have new ways to, to move around. But let's make it even more complicated and keep them at the same temperature. So will a mole of neon and a mole of argon at the same temperature and volume and pressure and all that stuff have different amounts of entropy and why? So if you've had some time to think about it, the answer is actually yes, there are, and it's because of the electrons. 
So argon has more electrons. There are more ways for them to be arranged. So argon is more entropic than neon, all other things being equal. How about three different molecules, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and dinitrogen tetroxide? And so why would they be entropically different? Um, again, same temperature, pressure, all that stuff. And the answer is the bonds. So the more bonds, the springy bonds that a molecule has, the more vibrational motions it has available to it. So for example, a diatomic molecule has one vibrational motion available to it, just basically the, the atoms move back and forth um, towards and away from each other. Now, when you go to a bent triatomic like NO2 here, then there are other types of motions. So basically one bond can move back and forth, the other bond can move back and forth, and these atoms can move towards or away from each other. This angle can change. And as you increase the number of bonds, all of these possibilities start to increase as well. Um, as a matter of fact, there's, there's a formula for this. And that for or n atoms there will be 3n minus 6 vibrations All right so more atoms more vibrations possible so in general because of this entropy will increase with molecular size so the n204 is the most entropic of this bunch and the NO is the least.